you for inviting us here today. I'm Catherine Lynch, a developer on the PA Digital Developers team. These are my colleagues, Delphine Kana and Chad Nelson. Chad is also a member of the developers team for PA Digital, and Delphine works on the PA Digital Planning Group and Founders Group. And today we're going to talk to you about our approach to a Hydra-based DPLA service hub for the state of Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania DPLA effort is managed through PA Digital, the service hub for the state of Pennsylvania, and the PA Digital Partnership, a partnership of Pennsylvania institutions. To quote from PA Digital's mission, libraries, historical societies, museums, and related cultural heritage institutions in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania contain cultural heritage historical collections of great depth and richness. The mission of PA Digital is to make the, collection, the digital collections of the Commonwealth's cultural heritage institutions widely discoverable. In an effort to enhance support for PA's digital collections, PA Digital has been poised to build something entirely new, technically and socially. So I'm going to give a quick rundown of the project timeline so far, and then Chad and I are going to cover some of the technical aspects and some of the technical features. And if that doesn't float your boat, Delphine is going to give some information about the social engineering aspect of PA Digital. And finally, we're going to wrap up with some musings about future development plans in the state of the project. In August 2014, a group representing various Pennsylvania libraries and cultural heritage institutions met in Harrisburg uh, to discuss exploring creation of a DPLA service hub to enhance support of digital collections in the state of Pennsylvania. This meeting started in motion the ultimate formation of PA Digital. In September and October of the same year, in an effort to help formulate a plan for development and therefore the formation of a development team, Temple University, in, a, in support of its role in the project, undertook an environmental scan and developed a very simple proof of concept software that performed basic functionality for harvesting metadata through OAI PMH, performed simple sanitization, and exposed it back through an OAI PMH feed. I'll be going into both of these in more depth in a little while. Based on this early work, the PA Digital Developers team, consisting of developers from Penn State and Temple, uh, developed DPLAH together. Um, it's a Hydra-based head on that based on the October prototype. We refined, improved, and developed on that prototype from December 2014 through April 2015, and in April it was completed and shared with PA Digital teams, PA stakeholders, and the DPLA. It includes all kinds of good stuff, like robust OAI, harvesting and serving, more sophisticated metadata transformations for basic cleanup and for the needs of the DPLA, um, a web-based preview layer, and logging mechanisms. And again, we're going to talk about all that soon, promise. We had a small sprint again in June to July 2015 for additional enhancements based on feedback both from the DPLA and from PA Digital's metadata team and to make the application production ready. And on August 28, 2015, just over a year to the day since that initial meeting of the mines in Harrisburg, PA Digital Service Hub application was approved by the DPLA. We slay all slaves. All right, there's no time. <laughs> October, from October through the present, PA Digital's teams have been working on improvements for our metadata and to the software's harvesting and transformation abilities based on DPLA's feedback and the metadata team's work on test harvesting new seeds for later inclusion in the DPLA through, DPLA through PA Digital. Now, as I mentioned before embarking on any heavy-duty development of an aggregator, we undertook an environmental scan of tools that other hubs were using and or those that might be able to do the job. We naturally wanted to be deliberate about choosing what we were going to use and need to support long term and had the relative luxury of building something without technical decisions or infrastructure already being in place. We looked at Repox, the open source data aggregation and interoperability manager. On the plus side, it leveraged technology that we were already supporting elsewhere and therefore that we knew we could support easily such as J Java and Jetty and other hubs were using it so we knew that it could serve the DPLA's needs. However, we shied away from it because it lacks a front end used for previewing harvested metadata, something that was important to the project for various reasons. Additionally, while it is open source, a dive into the code indicated that any sort of customized transformations to metadata that we might want to make were going to be very hard to do and basically would result in us forking the project and not really using Repox, but some hacked version of Repox, a Frankenstein, if you will. There was also the ROAI harvester package. In very early exploration, we were able to harvest OAI through R and uh, transform these into XML files that sat on the file system and let Hydra take it from there, transforming, ingesting, etc. However, this could not work long term as this was basically proposing support for a Hydra head and something completely unintegrated separate tool that used C and C++, which is the only place that thing was going to be used, 
and created a weak link for communication between the application itself and the harvesting component because it would only be relying on presence of files on the file system, something that could go wrong quickly. However, from this work, we were able to develop the rudimentary Hydra-based harvester, relying on the Ruby OAI gem harvesting from for harvesting from seeds and going from there. With all of the proof of concept basic actions doable in this tightly coupled and more easily supportable stack, and both Penn State and Temple University libraries, who were able to put developers on this pilot project, moving forward committed to supporting Hydra for their own institutions, committing to support it for this pilot made good sense. And now I'm going to hand it off to Chad for some of the technical aspects. Hello. Um, so as Kate said, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the technical aspects. And I'm going to start by just talking about the kind of application architecture. Um, so um, as Kate said, we ended up, uh, ended up with a Ruby on Rails Hydra application. So um, we pull in all the, the Hydra gems, uh, and the most prominent of those is the Blacklight gem, um, which does a lot of the heavy lifting in the front end. Um, it, we built on top of Fedora 3. Um, it, Fedora 4 was not really quite uh, mature at the point where the project kicked off, so uh, using Fedora 3, which was very well tested, very well, <coughs> uh, the, everything was kind of in place and mature. Um, using Solar as a, a typical um, Hydra application, and then we were using Redis and Rescue to do kind of queuing, um, and we'll get a little bit more into that later um, about how, how we use that. So, um, and then, so like those are the, the, the software components that are part of it, but I also wanna talk about the conceptual parts that are um, included in the, in the aggregator, and they can really be broken down into three main chunks. The first one is ETL, so extract, transform, load, a kind of um, standard way of thinking about moving data from one application to another. Um, the human interface for display and QA is the second kind of major component of the aggregator. And the third is uh, exposing the data to the, to the DPLA, the, kind of the whole point of it. Um, so let's start with ETL. Um, I couldn't believe there was actually a really good image for ETL out there, but this was pretty perfect. Um, so ETL, as I said, is, is extract, transform, load. It's a very typical workflow in, um, in kind of moving data around applications, not just in libraries, but in the broader data world and uh, software world. So um, uh, that is a lot of what we're doing, and it's the majority of the work that we really put into, um, uh, that was really put into the aggregator. So um, let's start with the extract part. So um, we do all of our harvesting via OAI, um, and uh, that makes it nice and nice and easy in that we don't have to support multiple different uh, kind of feeds coming in. Um, we do have some some uh, partners that provide data that actually don't have an OAI endpoint, and we've worked around that. And Kate will be talking more about that later, how we, how we dealt with that. But um, having a one single way to get the data in his uh, via OAI simplified our lives quite a bit. Um, so that's the. Uh, a little bit of the harvest. So what else do we do in the, in the extract part? Um, we, we, there's a metadata, there's a, um, an interface for metadata staff to kind of kick off harvesting of the seeds. Um, seeds is our kind of term for each individual collection um, that we're harvesting from, a, um, from an institution. So uh, we provided that so that uh, it's not just like a, there's one set time where the harvests happen, but as metadata staff are working with um, working with the, the uh, institutions that, were, that are providing the data, and they're saying, okay, we need you to you know, um, uh, change your DC mappings, we need you to you know, fix these, what the data in certain fields, they can, after the institution has told them, okay, we're done, the metadata team can kick off another, uh, another harvest of just that individual seed so that the feedback loop is much quicker. Um, so that was an absolutely essential part of it. There's command line for doing it too, mostly for the developers to kind of test things out, but. Um, it's there because we could put it there, and you know, developers like command line things, so we built it. Um, uh, so this is just an example of the uh, the, the interface um, for uh, managing the harvesting of seeds. So it just kind of lists uh, a, 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 the institution's name, the seed, the institution, um, where the endpoint is, and maybe a little bit more information about it, and then gives the wait, can you use this pointer? Oh, here we go. Yeah, can you show this pointer? Um, the, the various different options they have for harvesting a seed, harvesting all the, uh, all the seeds from that institution, deleting all the seeds from an institution if they really want to drop everything out. 
um, and start over with that institution. So it, it just gives you a sense of the options. So that, that interface was a big part of what we did. And there's another part to that interface, um, which was the um, uh, managing the managing the seeds themselves, whether it be creating a new seed, so like the metadata team manages adding a new seed and adding in the, the, the new endpoint, OAI endpoint URL, um, but also managing what that feed's gonna be like. Are we getting DC or QDC data from their OAI? Um, uh, is What type of repository is it? So we've defined this kind of um, things like, is it a content DM uh, uh, repository? If that's the case, then we do a certain set of transformations and harvest a particular way. It just gives us a, a little bit of extra data that um, we can use in the transformation process later to simplify, you know, simplify that process. So uh, the metadata team has an interface to uh, you know, note that and you know, make the, the whole process smoother. Um, also to add in write statements, if uh, since, D, since DPLA requires write statements in every record, um, we have a way to kind of add in, drop in blanket write statements for all the records from a seed, and that can be done by the metadata team at this, play, at this level, um, and also details about thumbnails and various other kinds of um, mm -hmm. aspects of each seed, like what data we're gonna be pulling from it. So, and this is a, a quick look at the, that um, the interface for managing an individual seed. So just kind of you know who it is, what the name is, what the endpoint is, um, uh, what the collection name is. So if it's a particular set from an OAI feed, not just like everything that they have in their OAI feed, but an individual set, what that set is, how to reference it. Um, so yeah, so that that's the second major part of the the that interface. So um, the so there's the extract part or the and then the transform part. Um, so we're harvesting. OAI, so lots of XML in, and we are outputting um, XML for Fedora, um, so FoxML, the, the standard um, Fedora 3 uh, data model. Um, we're outputting DC that uh, feeds the uh, OAI PMH endpoint that we are exposing to DPLA. So with lots of XML in, lots of XML out, it just made sense to do almost all of it in XSLT. Um, not exclusively, but there is a lot of XSLT in there. So um, we're mostly doing those transformations, as I said, to FoxML and to DC. Um, the DC mapping is specific to what our mapping for DPLA, uh, how, what, where they've asked us to kind of put particular fields um, so that they know they can extract them for their purposes. And then um, we also, at this point, do uh, deal with thumbnail drivers. So this is the idea that maybe we get a, we, we don't necessarily get the URL to a thumbnail from uh, every individual from the seeds, but we'll get, we know how to construct a URL to their thumbnail because it's always consistent. So at this point, we, we deal with that, whether it's for content DM or view find or, so, or some, other, um, uh, some other application that we know, repository application. Um, and uh, the other part of the transform is also doing DPLA specific transformations. So as I said, the blanket write statements that we need to have. Um, getting the language codes up to snuff to that in, in the way they need to be, um, formatting the dates in the, in the right way, um, and then you know, setting up the formats, the, the, the uh, item formats in the, the preferred nomenclature. So, um, and then last is the load part, which is the mostly easy part. Um, we really leverage the uh, Hydra stack here to um, get our data you know, from these XML files into Fedora and into Solar so that we can um, uh, so that they can feed our, our front end application. Um, so the second major part of the application, of the, the kind of like um, the conceptual architecture is the display in QA. I'm just gonna be really brief on this. So it's basically for our metadata team to have a really easy interface to, to look at what data is, has come in from those individual seeds and quickly get feedback on whether or not our mappings are working and our transformations are working. Um, and we really leverage black light here, and it's doing a lot of the high, hard work and meant we didn't have to re-implement that wheel, and Kate is really gonna go over it uh, more uh, in depth. Um, and finally, the last piece is exposing the data the, to the DPLA. I mean, the kind of whole reason for doing this. So um, it's built on top of the Fedora 3 OAI endpoint um, that's natively part of Fedora 3, um, and there's one major limitation in that it's simple DC only. Um, we couldn't do QDC, so that meant that our, uh, the, our, what we expose is quite simple, um, and so we, could, we didn't have quite the nuance in the mapping that we maybe would have liked to have, and so that complicated our, our interaction with DPLA. Um, and I believe, 
that is my part done, so I'll give it back to Kate to talk about a few other uh, features. Like a well-oiled machine. <laughs> um, so in supporting many institutions as possible, as Chad mentioned, we wanted to be able to find a way uh, to support organizations that did not have an OAI feed, but that had effectively records and metadata online that they hosted, like the Free Library of Philadelphia. You see it here in their, yay! You see here in uh, their own interface. Um, we wanted to get the data to the DPLA if we could, but in a way that was scalable and sustainable for us to maintain, and a way that was easy for any contributing organization that can't get OAI turned on to be able to onboard, a low barrier of entry, if you will. And spoiler alert, we were able to do that. Here's that same record in our interface, ready to go for the DPLA. Um, this was accomplished with the pass-through workflow, taking a simple uh, spreadsheet of metadata from a contributing institution and importing the records as items into a, an uh, Omeka website using the Omeka CSV import plugin, and then exposing that through an OAI feed from that same Omeka website through the Omeka repository plugin. And from there, the aggregating software did a little bit of heavy lifting, sanitizing data, primarily removing references to transient erroneous Omeka pointer records and replacing them with references back to the original source records only so that you can see the steps here from start to finish, it's CSV, imported into Omeka using the CSV plugin, exposed to the aggregator through the OAI repository plugin, and while it's being harvested into the aggregator, we remove some of these references. The records made their way into the harvester with a spreadsheet and a few presses of a button, and the pass-through Omeka site is intentionally never detected by the DPLA as the original source of metadata, as it's not intended to be that. As we said, we have an emphasis here on scalability, the transiency of that intermediary data, which means that we can delete and recreate items in the Omeka pass-through website as often as we want, and it will still keep the original record if we're referencing records whose IDs are stable on the other end. Um, and we managed this at the hub level, which is good, so that we're again able to keep this in scale. And finally, a web-based preview. As I promised, I would get to it. And so as you've seen through various screenshots so far, and as Chad mentioned earlier, we're using the Blacklight Discovery layer to preview records. This allows us to see our metadata and thumbnail pointers post-transformation after the hub does all of its work to treat uh, for simple sanitization, for DPLA-specific needs, and for some of the customizations that Chad went through earlier as well, giving us a sense of what we're sending the DPLA and what it's gonna look like on their front end. We've got two instances of the software running in production. As you can't really see on the projector here, which was what I was afraid of, but on uh, this one here, it's the production one. This one here is our testing one. In addition to the title, uh, we actually even have uh, the testing one looks light blue um, as a way for us to never, uh, never confuse the two and to further distinguish the two while working. So the production, the production instance is the one that we point the DPLA to. And we only harvest records into that one when we have run them through here and the metadata team and everyone has signed off that they look good enough to be reviewed by the DPLA, sent to the DPLA for actual harvesting. Um, this web preview layer is an excellent review point for stakeholders to see what their metadata transformed and corrected in the enhancing phase will look like in the DPLA, eliminating any sort of surprises on their end when it's actually in the DPLA. It also reduces our need to continuously re-harvest and retest seeds in our production uh, instance when metadata is transformed but doesn't look quite right just yet. This in turn is intended to cut down on the DPLA's need to perform reharvests outside of a regular schedule when we're in production. It also helps in PA Digital quantifying our records and represented organizations, and it's very useful when working with stakeholders going back and forth about their data and seeds to reflect on our ongoing work to eventually include them. It's not like a black box where we're basically just saying, give us your OAI feed, okay, thumbs up or thumbs down, go fix this thing, okay, it works or it doesn't work, try again. It's far more communicative and informative process than all of that. And finally, the logs. The aggregator generates logs for every harvesting task triggered from the dashboard that Chad showed us. Harvesting and deleting, they all get recorded as simple text files uh, that update live as the process is happening. This is a feature that's built out to serve as a monitoring point for users during harvesting, so they've got something that can help them know a second to second what's happening as opposed to just triggering a job and waiting and hoping that it completes and you either know it completed or it died and then having to figure out what's going on. Um, this feature is also um, meant to allow for text files to be serving as easily shareable, referenceable artifacts of activity. They're very useful in uh, troubleshooting records that have been 
uh, breaking harvests and where. So if the metadata team encounters an issue, one of the first things that they'll send us, the, met the developers team, for troubleshooting is the log where they notice something was wrong. Um, it also records basic and seed level configurations that are happening. If you can see up here, this is recording all of the seed level configurations that we have activated for that particular seed so that we're again documenting what we're doing to those, uh, those records. And these logs are very flexible for additional, for, for building out new features and recording new data. We've already done that in the first few phases and they're flexible enough to include more information as we progress. And now, Delphine. Okay, so I'm fighting a bit of a cold, so I hope that won't come too much in the way in forms of cough or whatnot. All right, so, um, sorry. So I'm going to talk to you about the social engineering side. Um, really, how did the aggregator help us build uh, our project on the human side? Um, so just to give you a bit more context, um, the PA Digital uh, Endeavor was really a, a brand new effort uh, for our state. And, um, we, uh, it was not a situation where we were already um, a well-established statewide digital library repository. Uh, it was a new collaboration developed, spe developed specifically for the primary purpose of becoming a DPLA hub. And so we knew that, um, sorry, yeah, it's gonna get off, okay. We knew that uh, some hubs in our situations um, uh, had relied on harvesting uh, tools that did not offer them a front end. And as Kate mentioned, we felt that was really important, in fact, for us to have a front end to uh, give us something to look at. And um, it turns out that, yes, we were right. It was extremely helpful to have this aggregator that was, you know, gave us this web uh, interface to look at. Um, so I'm going to just go uh, through some of the, the ways in which that helped us. So first, um, the aggregator significantly increased um, our, um, the, the, uh, the buy-in among all the project participants. The first thing is that um, the aggregator, sorry, um, basically it allowed us to make the project uh, really concrete early on. Uh, as we developed uh, the quick proof of concept that Kate mentioned at the beginning of the project, right away we had something we could show and point people to. Uh, that felt uh, very tangible and, uh, you know, the project may, uh, was, um, we felt was more attainable as a result. At a time when uh, the rest of the project really consisted mostly of long coordination uh, conversations and trying to make sure that all institutions involved were on the same page. So it was really nice to be able to turn to the aggregators and see, look, it's real. That's how it's going to look when we are really, uh, uh, when we're able to, to make everything uh, dovetail nice, nicely and, and, um, and get all our content in there. It also helped us a lot with outreach. Um, beyond the core uh, team that was were cross-institutional, cross but was a small number of institutions really working towards uh, getting things started uh, for the Pennsylvania Hub. Um, we were also trying to reach out to uh, the maximum number of institutions to convince them to contribute their content. And uh, again, being able to show them how it actually looked, how the content looked, which was well before we had anything, of course, live in the DPLA. So we could not have pointed to anything in the DPLA to uh, show people how things would uh, look eventually. In the same way, um, it, uh, the, the having the aggregator greatly facilitated communication with really any stakeholders uh, that came our way. <coughs> So the aggregator is also a powerful tool for data review, normalization, and remediation. Um, Kate hinted at that. Um, but basically, it has been uh, incredibly helpful to be able to show um, the aggregator, that is, the, the, the data um, that the candidate uh, institutions would provide us to show them early on how their data looked uh, once uploaded in the test instance. and. Um, and clearly it helped a lot in terms of being able to uh, look at any problems that might be there. It's also simply more motivating to fix issues when you can actually see them, as opposed to just, you know, if someone described to you very uh, abstractly that yes, there are issues. Uh, 
Um, another great strength of the aggregator is because it is entirely web-based, uh, the, in terms of the staff interface, it means that the metadata team can very easily uh, spread out the, the work among various um, people. And basically, we can distribute the workflows really easily and, um, and, and modify the workflows uh, as, as, uh, as we need. So that has been very, very convenient and flexible, ha added a great level of flexibility. Okay. Uh, moving forward, we also really like the fact that we will be able to keep adding new collections to the PA uh, aggregator um, on an ongoing basis, independently of the DPLA harvest schedules. Uh, this will be great to show progress as a, on a continuous basis, even if the DPLA only, uh, is only able to harvest us uh, every few months. Okay. Um, so to conclude, this was really, really helpful. So for new hubs, uh, people who are looking at uh, building a hub and don't have already a repository that is statewide, uh, we hope that you know, can serve as, a, as a, a, um, a good recommendation for you that really uh, we strongly recommend to you, whether it is you know, exactly a Hydra-based repository or something else, but try, uh, sorry, aggregator, we strongly recommend that uh, you try to have some kind of web-based uh, aggregator that you can show people and, and use. And now Chad is going to talk to us about future developments. <coughs> okay, so um, as with every project, we're still <laughs> moving forward with it, even though we've you know um, gotten the point we're at now. Um, so we right now we're working on kind of continuous improvements um, as well as possible new features. Um, there are requests from various uh, groups, the metadata team, the developers, and from the DPLA themselves. So um, continuous improvements. Um, one of the things we're going to be working on soon and slowly kind of we're working on is automating a bit of our infrastructure with Ansible um, just to, it'll speed up releasing new features and bug fixes, um, simplify the development process, make it easier to onboard kind of new developers if there's a really kind of straightforward way for them to get up, set up, and start running their own harvester, um, and you know, just kind of good practice to have some nice automated infrastructure. Um, and the second kind of ongoing improvement we're gonna be doing is kind of constantly tweaking for new edge cases that come up. So um, as we're, as kind of new institutions contact us and you know, ask us to harvest their data, inevitably something goes wrong. <laughs> like you know, there's a field that's mapped slightly differently or their OAI is implemented slightly differently. And you know, it, there's lots of little edge cases that kind of most of the time the metadata team can handle onboarding new, um, new institutions without our input, but occasionally they need it. So kind of as an ongoing as needed basis where um, you know, adding fixes, uh, dealing with edge cases, um, uh, and yeah, just trying to make it work. So um, that's the continuous improvement. Um, there are some features that we've been, have been requested um, from the metadata team. Um, the, the first big request was for a better write statement reports. Um, so as you know, write statements is a big thing that you know, DPLA really wants to make sure that all records have a write statement, and we do this kind of blanket application. Um, but I think what they want, the metadata team would like more granular control over what, um, how they see what records are missing, um, uh, uh, write statements, like from which sets, from which providers, um, and you know, just kind of, just to help them kind of target who they need to talk to, uh, what feedback they can give to the institutions we're partnering with and those kinds of things. Um, and the second is they just want a bit more granular control over how we, um, how they interact with managing and editing the, the seeds and the hubs. Um, so let's say if we have 20 seeds from a, one particular institution because they have 20 different collections that they want us to harvest, um, there's no way right now to kind of just, just group those together and edit all of those together. So that's one of the things they've kind of asked for um, and we need to kind of take a step back and look at the way it's, it is right now. Um, it, it's kind of structured right now, but uh, I could definitely see how that would be really useful. I've seen it in my own testing. So, uh, and there's a few other things like that of just you know better ways to make it easier for them for their their workflows when they're managing these the the, the partner institutions seeds. Um, so developers requests. Uh, well, um, one of the things that we've talked about is scheduled harvests. Adding that in um, just like 
you know, the ability to just kind of on a regular basis go out, grab everything that's new from an organization, from a, a seed, so that we're getting the latest data from them. <clears throat> Figuring out how we need to do that, where we need to do it, how we need to, you know, how it'll work with kind of uptime for the application, that kind of stuff. Um, and second, maybe move to Fedora 4. Um, it's got better support for OAI uh, harvesting, like QDC. Uh, it's a more supported modern application, so that would be nice, but you know, uh, it would be quite a bit of work because it's not XML based. Um, it's it's moved to a totally RDF model. So the kind of work we do right now doing XSLT transformations from uh, OAI, har OAI harvests to FoxML is not really gonna be applicable anymore. So it would be, again, a, another rethink. It's kind of a bigger piece. So, um, but you know, developers like those kinds of things. So, <laughs> um, and the last ones are more, uh, uh, a bit more, requests from the DPLA themselves, um, which one is to expose qualified Dublin Core so that we can give them a more nuanced data feed that we're giving to them so that we don't have to quite hack, you know, uh, fields into places where they don't belong. Um, you know, like, oh, well, if it's the second field in the identifier, then it's the thumbnail, like weird things like that, that where we have a limited number of fields um, in, in simple Dublin Core, we have to just put stuff where we can. Um, and the second one is better handling of thumbnails. There's times where we're telling them there's a thumbnail, but actually there, there's no thumbnail there um, because we're just constructing the thumbnail URL based on the, um, the repository type. We're just saying, okay, well, if the record is here, then the thumbnail is here, um, and that's not always the case. So we really need to do some looking at, internally in the application, how we do that so that we're not sending them kind of false information. Uh, and finally, I'll pass it off to Delphine for the conclusion. Okay, the conclusion. So there are a few, few things we wanted to tell you as, a, uh, as we conclude. And the first thing is that Kermit, Kermit the, the frog is back because we are live in DPLA as of two days ago. <laughs> so we're really happy about that and uh, certainly, um, you know, the last uh, a year and a half, we've worked hard uh, towards that goal, so we're delighted. Uh, we would like to um, thank a whole bunch of people that I'm, of course, not going to, to go through the whole list, uh, but, you know, this really represents the work of a number of institutions and a number of people, and uh, we've really come together very nicely to achieve this goal, so we are really proud of ourselves. Okay. Um, we also... Um, would um, uh, recommend that uh, you try it out. Our code is uh, on GitHub, and um, so you feel free to download our code and try it out and uh, tell us, um, you know, we will be happy with to get any feedback from you. And um, that's what we have for you today. So thank you, and we will now take questions.
so to be clear, um, I mean, we think that hydro gives us a lot more flexibility to, uh, to be an aggregator. We never thought of using Omeka as an aggregator, but it just so happened we had an Omeka in instance at Temple, and we realized when we were trying to really, we were sort of uh, wondering, hmm, how could we deal with people don't, that don't have an OAI feed? Um, it, we just you know, realized, like, hey, what about we try through um, uh, Omeka, because Omeka is really good at importing spreadsheets. And so that's how we developed that solution. But it's, it's really sort of a, on the side, as opposed to our, our hydro-based aggregator that's really the centerpiece. Other questions? Like we went live with over 130,000 users, so that's the first first step. And then uh, we have like a number of other uh, institutions and collections, because also some collect some uh, institutions started with um, a small small fraction of their collections. So in the next round, we're going to be adding both from pre existing uh, contributors and new contributors. So yeah. Anything else? Thank you very much.